Good morning. Welcome to Prepare the Way. I'm Pastor Mark Driscoll. We're here uh, going through the Gospel of Matthew, uh, looking at the kingdom of heaven and what is it, how does it work in our lives, and what does it mean? You know, to be a Christian, um, again, I, I say this, I might say this every time, I don't know, but you know, being a Christian is not about just deciding to join a religion you agree with. Uh, there are plenty of those, and if you want to be a religious person, you can do that. Well, you are a religious person. You do something out of tradition and routine all the time. And so you're religious. If You might be religious about drugs. I mean, you know, you might be religious about washing your car on Saturday afternoon. You might, you know, but, and that's okay. And we're, we're by nature, we're religious people and we do things. So that's, that's fine. But religion won't save you, right? And so what saves you is the kingdom. It's the king, right? The king saves you, Jesus. But he enters you into a kingdom. And so... Being a Christian is about being part of this greatest uh, worldwide movement ever, uh, the kingdom of heaven being at hand and the, the rule, the reign of God. And you enter into that when you repent of your sins, right? And you allow him to fill you with the Holy Spirit because you've got to have the Spirit to, to live in the kingdom. That's what Jesus said. Unless you're born of the Spirit, you can't see the kingdom or even enter into it. Um, it's not just about behavior. It's about uh, God living in you, right? Is he living in you? That's the question. I'm not asking, are you, are you well behaved? It's Jesus living inside of you. Is he in control? Are you, are you walking in the spirit? Because that's the kingdom. And when you walk in relationship with him, he'll show you the kingdom on earth. And then you get to live that out, the values, the ethics, the morality of the kingdom, the, the wisdom of the kingdom, the power, the authority, the love of the kingdom, all the great things that come with being part of the kingdom of heaven. And then when you die, you go to live in the fullness of the kingdom. Or when Christ comes, he brings the fullness of the kingdom here. And uh, the, in Ephesians, it says that God's ultimate plan is to unite everything in heaven and on earth in Jesus, that, that ultimate kingdom. And so I'm, I'm entering into that. I'm already getting a foretaste of that by my daily life with him. And then when it comes, uh, you know, that's the fullness of it. And so that's the thing. And so are you living in the kingdom? And that's what we're talking about. Prepare the way because the Lord is coming. He's coming every, every day into your life, knocking on your door, saying, look, behold, I stand at the door and knock. You know, if anybody hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and the kingdom will show up in your life. Uh, have you opened the door? You know, we talk about all kind of behavioral stuff. Have you opened the door? Jesus is here. He's calling on you, right? He's inviting you. Uh, turn from your sins. They're not doing you any good. Turn from that nonsense and follow the king. Follow the one who made you and redeemed you, who loves you, has a great purpose for your life. And it lasts forever. And uh, there's nothing better, really nothing better. So he's inviting you to that. He's inviting you to that. Uh, turn from the vain things of this world that don't make any sense anyway. And just turn to him and just come after him. In that pursuit of the kingdom, uh, it's, it's pursued by faith in the grace of God, the love and mercy of God. It's not pursued in our own goodness and ability to be good. It's, it's coming to him saying, I can't be good, God. I, I, I just can't. I, only you can be good, and you've got to be good through me because I'm no good at it. Um, just come in and fill me, Lord. Make me new. But get desperate for Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Get desperate for him. You know? Don't get desperate for religion. Don't get desperate for your favorite pet doctrines. Get hungry for him. You know, it's it's about Jesus. I just, you know, he's just the greatest. And he's, he loves you so much. I just, you know, well, we're talking about that kingdom. It's an awesome kingdom. It's the only kingdom that lasts forever. And he's inviting you into it. Let me pray with you right now to get started. And you might... You might even talk to him when you're for, while I'm praying. You might say, "Hey, Lord, I want to. I want in." You know, there's no. You don't have to be religious about it. Just be tr be truthful. Tell him you want in. Uh, just come on. You're invited. Come on in, Lord. Thanks for this day. Thanks for your love. Thank you, Lord, that the door is wide open. But that door will close. Time is moving on, and that door will close. But right now, it's open. Lord, I pray for every person listening right now that they say, yes, Jesus. Lord, make me new. Make, bring me into your kingdom. Forgive me of my sin. 
and make me a brand new person. Free me from the bondage of the devil. Uh, help me walk in your joy and your purpose and freedom. And uh, Lord, I pray everybody would do that. Uh, even us Christians need to say it again sometimes. Just say it over and over. Now, Lord, help us to walk in the kingdom. Help us to live in the glory of your kingdom on this earth. Help us to bring heaven here, Lord Jesus, before we go to heaven there. Lord, help us to look like people who just got back from heaven, not people who are trying to get there, people who've, who've already been there and come back. Lord, help us live out your purpose and your justice, your righteousness, your goodness and your love through us by, by faith. Lord, help us to do that. Uh, as your church, as your individuals too. Now Lord, help us right now as we're looking into your word. Open your word to us. Lord, just help us to hear what you got to say. Now, Lord, we love you. And we're, we're just, we want to follow you all the way. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the older I get, the more simple this thing becomes. I used to get so caught up and everybody has to agree with me about everything. Now, you know, and I, I'm just free from all that. Now, sure, we have doctrines that you've got to believe. <laughs> you can't just go willy-nilly and believe whatever you want to. I get that. But there's so much junk that we beat each other up with, right? We Christians, I mean, we get obsessed with stuff that God don't even care about. Like, we'll sit around and fight about how you get baptized, and Jesus never told us how to get baptized. You ever notice that? Now, I know some of y'all preachers are pulling out your Greek baptizo word so you can tell me well, how you do it, but listen here. Listen, I get, I've read that. I know that. I dunk people. It's cool. But look here. That is not important. That is not important. Stop it. Stop fighting over it. But that's another sermon for another day. I want to talk about, uh, my message today is called, Witch Hunters Beware. I And, and if, while you're waiting for me to get to the text, it's in Matthew 12. We're going to get there real soon, but let me, let me do the wind-up first, okay? Here's the deal. I think we're in a time of revival in our country. I, I really do. It's the early part. It's the repentance part. I, see, I, I think revival always begins with repentance, and, and it doesn't always feel like revival at first. It really doesn't. Um, sometimes it feels painful, downright hurtful. Look in the Bible at times of repentance. Uh, they're not pretty. I believe we're in a time when, when uh, the church in America is searching her heart. I, I really believe that because you hear more talk of things like repentance, return to the Word of God. Uh, you hear people pointing out where uh, preaching is not preaching. You've heard me talk about false prophets and false preaching, and, and it's out there. I don't want to lie about that. There's some, there's some fake stuff out there. But, but you know, the fact that we're aware of that now is, is a sign of revival. It's, it's really good. You think about it. We're, away, we're not living in the... Some of us have stopped drinking the Kool-Aid of, uh, you know, cultural Christianity. See, that's when revival starts. When, when it stops being about, you know, oh, well, I'm a Christian, and Jesus is going to make me rich and hot and beautiful and wonderful and he's going to help me make money and he's going to fulfill all my desires because it's all about me and, and go Jesus as long as he's doing what I want um, your kingdom come my will be done is the prayer of so many people but uh, you know repentance has begun and people are starting to say hey wait a minute we've been messing up but there's a danger there's a danger that as we do that and we search our heart and we try to examine the teaching and make sure it's appropriate and, and true, that we can become obsessed with witch hunters, with witch hunting. Uh, my message is entitled, Witch Hunters Beware. Because I have noticed an, an increasing number of people using the word heretic on everybody. Uh, there are whole websites devoted to lists of people. They're a heretic, and they'll show a video clip of a half of a phrase that somebody said and say, see, they're a heretic. They, they claim something I don't agree with. And, and so what happens is, is that when we get that way, we become the kind of person that can see the devil in everybody except himself or herself. That's when the problem comes. When I begin, when I can spot the devil in you, but I can't spot the devil in me, 
and I'm convinced that I'm probably the only person who's really doing the right thing and only one telling the truth. I mean, that nobody would really say that out loud. Well, maybe some would, but most of us wouldn't. But I think some of us feel that way. Some of us think I'm the only one. And some people are crawling on the Internet. I, I will promise you, somewhere along the line, somebody's going to come across this video. And the only per reason they're listening to it is to catch me saying something so they can call me a heretic. Well, okay. If you want to do that, have fun. But here's the thing. We do incredible damage to the church. When we go beyond sincere pursuit of truth into, I got to find everybody who's not like me and call them a heretic. Now, there's a story in the Bible where Jesus gives a stern warning about what you call heresy, or what you call evil. And he says, look, you'd better be very careful, and you'd better be absolutely sure that it's the devil before you call it the devil. The only, and he addresses this in terms of the unpardonable sin, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It's one of the most uh, debated doctrines, the, the most confusing things, but it actually, it's really pretty simple what Jesus said. So I want us to read in Matthew 12 a warning to the witch hunter. A warning to the witch hunter in me, because sometimes I can be all about what's wrong with so-and-so. Why are they like this? Why are they like that? And, uh, you know, if you want to be a hypercritical religious person, that's your business. But you better, not, you better be careful what you call the devil. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you can say, I really don't like that preacher. I really don't like that church. I really don't like those people. I really don't like that doctrine. I don't know. But, you, but when you start saying the devil, and you start calling somebody the devil because of they're doing something you don't understand or you, you don't like, or because they don't use your favorite catchphrase when they preach, then you'd better be real careful. Um, it, you know, Paul warned us in Galatians 5. He said, um, you know, be careful, you who bite and devour one another, lest you be consumed by one another. And some of us are consuming each other, and we're biting each other to death, trying to prove that I'm more righteous than you. Anyway, let's get to it. I want to unpack what happened when Jesus mentioned the unpardonable sin. Because I think a lot of people worry, have I committed the unpardonable sin? Well, let me go ahead and tell you, if you're worried about it, you hadn't done it. You're okay. Now, you might need to repent of something. There might be some sins. But you haven't done anything unforgivable if you're sitting here worrying about it. I, I promise you, the person who does it don't care. Okay, now, but let's move on. Starting verse 22. Aren't you relieved? Whew. Okay, anyway. Verse 22 of Matthew 12. Let's set the scene. It says, Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him. So the man spoke and saw. Now, what we see, here's, here's the first thing, is what happened. To set the tone for this is a guy who was not possessed. He was oppressed. You, you realize there's a difference, right? A person who's possessed is inhabited by demonic spirits inside. A person who's oppressed is a person who from the outside the enemy has has latched onto them through some legal right that that devil has to, to oppress that person and in this case it manifested in um, blindness and inability to speak. <clears throat> I have seen people whose sickness was demonic oppression. Now not everybody is. You know most sickness is just sickness. You, you know you take your medicine, go to the doctor, all that kind of stuff. Pray for healing. That's fine. But sometimes it is demonic. And I've seen it. I don't have time to go into it today. But, but there are times that happens. And so Jesus uh, frees this man of demonic oppression. And people notice it. It's visible. He can see and he can talk. The demon is gone. Praise the Lord. He does that. He's still doing it today. But I'm, I, I don't want to get off on that today. Verse 23 says that now there were two reactions to this event. Let's look at the two reactions. And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? Meaning the Messiah. Is the Messiah? He's setting people free. He's got power. He ain't just reading Bible verses and yelling at people. He's got stuff's happening. People going away changed. 
is he is he the deal, right? They're starting to get curious. But then it says in verse 24, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it's only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. <laughs> they remind me of those people that every time a revival movement breaks out, they're the first one to yell devil. Well, that's just of the devil. I, you know, you guys got to watch out for that. You know, people getting healed and saved and delivered and, and somebody standing on the sidelines with their arms crossed. This is all of the devil. Or they go into a church service where somebody sings the kind of songs that person doesn't like. And they'll stand there while everybody else is worshiping God and having a great time. The theology is wrong in that song. I'm sorry. Now, I, I do believe your theology and your singing needs to be right. I get it. I understand that. But come on. Sometimes you just got to lighten up, right? Now, that doesn't mean you sing heresy, okay? What it means is uh, sometimes you can be so right you're wrong. There you go. So anyway, the, the, these Pharisees were, uh, were angry at something they did not possess. They didn't have that authority, and they were jealous. They were angry, and they were bitter, and they were also threatened. Now, we have to give them a little credit. They thought they were protecting God. They thought they were protecting the, the move of God. They thought they were protecting Israel from heresy. And they were saying, but, but when, you do, when you see Jesus doing the very things the prophets said Messiah would do, and that nobody else has ever done, and then you still look at it and say, well, that has to be the devil. Sometimes we have a tendency to demonize that which we do not possess in our own life or that which we do not understand. I'm going to get to that in a minute about the difference between when it's heresy and when it's not. That's what we're going to talk about. But these guys were not just opposing Jesus. They were calling him the devil. you got to get that. If you're going to understand the heart of what blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is, you've got to get to this point. They weren't just resisting Jesus. They weren't just rejecting Jesus. They were demonizing Jesus. He was the devil in their mind. And, and so here it is. And then Jesus gives his response. Now in his response, he gives a spiritual principle, and then he gives some examples, and then he gives an explanation, and then he gives a warning. So as we're working through that, what Jesus said, we're going to find out what blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is. I think you're probably already getting it anyway. First, he gives a spiritual principle. Let's look at what he says. Um, let's start off in verse 25. It says, knowing their thoughts. I love that. Jesus, he, he already knows what you're thinking. You might as well confess it. But anyway, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. And how will his kingdom stand? First of all, Jesus is talking in terms of two kingdoms. The... <coughs> Excuse me. There is the kingdom of God and there is the kingdom of the devil. They are not equal. I don't want you to think this is not a duality here. But there are separate kingdoms. There's a kingdom of darkness defeated by Jesus on the cross. And there's a kingdom of light which has come and is coming and will come. And ultimately will, will swallow up all of the darkness. And so here's the thing. These are not equal kingdoms. They are not parallel, but they are opposite there is a kingdom of darkness. There is a realm in our culture today of darkness. And some of it masquerades as light. We have to be honest about that and aware of that. But there's the kingdom of light. You cannot live in twilight. You cannot have a foot in both kingdoms. Many Christians are trying to do that. And Jesus says, look, even the devil has sense enough to know that he can't fight himself and win. Even the devil is smart enough to know that if I start casting myself out, I'm not going to have much left. Right? He's got enough problems with being defeated already that if he starts opposing himself, he's just going to fall apart anyway. And so here's the thing. I wish Christians were that smart. Some of us, we, we'll fight each other. I mean, we will fight other Christians to the death. Some of us get online, look, and all we want to do is fight Christians. All we want to do is let, let me go find a Christian I can beat up on. Let me find a Christian I can, I can give a hard time to. Let me find a Christian, a fellow Christian who I'm supposed to work with, who I'm supposed to love. Let me just beat them to death uh, with my Bible to show how righteous I am, to make myself feel okay. 
Because a lot of us are stuck in the trap that my identity is wrapped up in how good I am. It's not. My identity is wrapped up in Jesus. And when my identity is wrapped up in Jesus, I don't have to compete with other people because I'm in him, right? Some of y'all wrapped up in your religion, and that's why you're trying to be better than everybody else. So here's the thing. And then let's, let's move on. And so G Jesus says, look, first let me just explain to you the spiritual principle that any kingdom that turns in on itself is going to fall apart. And so that's not happening here, okay? I'm not the devil fighting the devil, okay? And then he goes on to say, therefore, no, 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 hold on, I'm jumping ahead of myself. And then in verse 27, he says, if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Jesus is predicting something. He's saying, okay, if I'm casting out demons by the power of the devil, when your kids get saved after I rise from the dead, and they get saved, and they get the power of God, and they start casting out demons, who, what are you going to say to them? Look at some Pharisee with a couple of young boys. He said, when your boys become Christians, and they see what you didn't see, and they start casting out demons, what are you going to say to them? Are you going to call them devil ch devils too? He's saying, look, but he, he says, look, by whom, he says, but, he says, therefore, they will be your judges. In other words, that generation is about to come up who's, believe, who's going to believe in Jesus, and their life is going to be a judgment against the, the, those who rejected Jesus. And those Christians, those first Jewish Christians, filled with power, began doing the things that Jesus did, and their life was a judgment against those who had rejected Jesus. And he's saying, that's going to happen. Get ready. Get, get ready. And then he goes on to say, But if it's by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Here's the thing. Jesus, the next thing Jesus says, no. When the devil's getting kicked out, that means the kingdom of God is being manifest. Friends, everywhere the devil is defeated, and we see it, the kingdom of God shows up. Now, the devil gets defeated in a lot of ways. Sometimes it's that supernatural casting out demons and freeing the oppressed and healing the sick. Anytime those power things happen, the kingdom of God is showing up. You better be careful and not oppose that. The devil doesn't cast himself out. Only Jesus casts out devils. Martin Luther King said, hate can't drive out hate, only love can. Jesus is perfect love, and when his perfect love contacts somebody oppressed by the devil, the devil gets cast out, or the healing comes, deliverance comes, or when somebody preaches the gospel and a lost person gets free from the bondage of sin, and they become, which is the, better than any other miracle, they get born again, the devil gets kicked out of their life because they heard the gospel, they repented of their sins, they believed in the Lord Jesus by his blood they were delivered from the the penalty and the power and the pra practice of sin and listen here they're set free the devil is getting beat up and wherever that's happening the kingdom of god is showing up boys and girls if you want to find a kingdom church go find a church where the devil's getting kicked out if you want to find the, the church that's the kingdom of darkness go find a church that's accommodating the devil we have both in our country we have churches that are kicking the devil out. And we have churches that are just sitting around accommodating the devil. Whatever the devil wants, we'll do it. The devil, whatever you want to dump on us, we'll accept it because we want people to come. And we want them to come to our church. And we want them to feel welcome and accepted. So we're just going to do whatever people want. And that see, that's, that's not freeing people. Freeing people is when you, you find freedom from sin. Not... A endorsement of sin. The gospel, Jesus didn't come to affirm our sin. He came to set us free. Jesus said, look, whoever sins is a slave of sin, and the slave doesn't remain in the house forever. Only the son does, and if the son sets you free, you're free indeed. The gospel is about freedom, not affirmation. The gospel is not about your self-esteem. It's about your self-transformation. The gospel is not about you finding yourself. It's about finding him because in him you find out who you truly are. In Jesus and who you are. And you turn from your the deception of sin into the freedom and glory and goodness of who God made you to be in the first place and who he redeemed you to be. That's the gospel. And if the gospel, wherever the gospel, listen, is setting people free, that's the kingdom showing up. You need to go there.
You need to hang out there. You need to hoof it over to that place because that's where God's doing his stuff. Now, I do understand that some people are, some movements are obsessed with miracles and supernatural and everything's all about supernatural and, and they've lost Jesus. They left him behind because they're chasing miracles. Listen, that, that's get a little wonky. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to judge that. I am going to say be careful of anybody who's so caught up in miracles that they aren't reading the word. They're not feeding the hungry. They're not helping the needy. They're not caring about righteousness and peace and, and freedom. They're just kind of, oh, let's go see a miracle. I love miracles. I've seen them. Man, they're awesome. But the essence of the gospel is save, people getting saved from sin and death and coming into relationship with Jesus, repenting of their sins, not, not saying, oh, my sins don't matter because I'm doing miracles. No, Jesus uh, warned against that. So don't get in that other place where you're so obsessed with miracles that you're missing him. You don't get disconnected from the head, as Paul says in Colossians. But let's move on. Because Jesus, here's what he says then. And then he gives the logic. He says, now let me tell you why I'm doing what I'm doing. Okay? Listen to this. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then he may plunder his house. Jesus is, is the stronger man. I love this. The devil's the strong man. And the devil is the prince of the power of the air. He has influence in this world. And he is binding people up. And he is messing people up because they're listening to him. But when the stronger one comes in and kicks him out of his house, that's what Jesus is doing. He's saying, look, I'm casting out demons because I'm the stronger man. And I'm the one who's plundering the devil. You know, the Bible says that on the cross, Jesus disarmed the principalities and the powers, making a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them through the cross. Jesus said, Jesus said that, in, that. Paul wrote that in Colossians chapter 2. Listen to this. So Jesus has broken the power of the devil. The only power the devil has now is the power that pe of deception and the power of temptation and, that, and that, that people give him when they just follow their flesh and they follow the world and they follow the devil and they just kind of go with it. But when a person turns to Jesus, that power is broken. He has broken into the house. Let me ask you a question. Have you let the stronger man break into your house? There's two. Who's running your house right now? The strong man named the devil or the stronger man named Jesus. They're not roommates. One rules or the other rules. They don't both rule your house. Which one are you allowing rule in your house? Literally. I mean, who, who's running your house? What are you watching on TV? What are you talking about? What games are you playing? What words are you using? How are you spending your time? How are you treating your spouse and your children? What kind of neighbor are you? You see, we know who's running the house by how we live. Let me tell you something. Jesus is the stronger man. It may be that you're in a house and you feel like, you know what, the devil is the strong man in my house. He is running the show. And I'm tired of it. Invite Jesus into your house. Invite him first into your heart. Then invite him into your house and say, Lord, kick out the devil. And anything that Jesus kicks out, let him have it. Take it. Kick it out. Kick it out. Kick out the filth. Kick out the lies. Kick out the deception. Kick out the dishonesty. Kick out the abuse. Kick out the violence. Kick out the jealousy. Kick out the, the gossip and the slander and the filthy language. Kick out the evil. This thing has to get practical here. Jesus didn't come just to kind of be this abstract concept in our house to make us feel good. He came in to confront the devil and destroy the work of the devil. He breaks into the strong man's house and kicks his butt and throws him out. I want to know what you've got in your house that he's wanting to kick out. Sometimes you've got to go ballistic spiritually, Christian. Some of us, the reason we don't have any closeness with God is because we want Jesus and the devil to be roommates. We want to be a little bit devil and a little bit angel. That might make a great country song, but that ain't gospel. Uh, that's not Jesus. He's not interested in that kind of partnership. What partnership does light have with darkness, Paul wrote? There's no... There's no partnership. The Jesus is not the, the, the good angel on this shoulder and the devil angel on this shoulder. No, sir. He's Lord and King. And he comes in, he breaks in the house. He breaks in the house and kicks the devil out. Have you let him kick him out? You got it? 
Just look around. Look at the atmosphere in your home. What is it? What's it reflecting? Jesus is here, and he's willing to enter in if you let him. He, he's standing at the door. He's knocking. He's saying, look, there's a big old strong man in your house, but I'm the stronger man. Let me come in. He'll do something Chuck Norris can't do. Listen. So here's the thing. Jesus is, is wanting to do that. So he's telling the Pharisees, that's what I'm about. That's, that's, I'm here to do that. I'm cleaning house. And then he goes on to explain. That's why he says, whoever's not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. In other words, he's saying to those Pharisees, look here, you're either going to help me or you're going to get in my way. You, you can't do both. You can't be neutral about Jesus. You can't say, well, I don't, I don't disagree with them. I'm just not following. No, 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 sir. No, sir. He says, if you're not gathering, you're scattering. If you're not with me, you are against me. That's it. That's the deal. Now, remember the context. He's saying this to Pharisees who are accusing him of serving the devil. That's what they're doing. Now, here goes, but he, he's going to get down to it now. Therefore, verse 31, therefore. What is that therefore, therefore? in light of what he just said, right? Therefore, in light of what I just told you, I tell you every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Buddy, that's hard. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the one to come. Buddy, that's serious business. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit friends, is not just saying something mean. It's not just cussing. It's not just a really bad sin. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. It is the flagrant, persistent, willful, unending opposition to Jesus and what he's doing in the world. Not just resisting it, but calling it the devil. Calling it the devil. They weren't just saying, oh, Jesus, we don't like you. They are saying, no, you are the devil. So when you begin to attribute the things that God is doing to the devil, you're treading on thin ice, friend. Now, this is a sin that a person can come, become so hardened that they really don't care. A person like that can hear this message and not care one bit. If you're a little nervous because maybe you've resisted Jesus too much, maybe you've spent too much time running from him, maybe you've spent too much time in the wild side, that's not blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And you can come to him. He said whoever speaks against the Son of Man well, can be forgiven, right? <clears throat> I know people spent their whole life criticizing Jesus. They didn't believe in Christianity. They didn't, they didn't need all that religion stuff. And then one day they come to realize, oh, yes, I do. That person can be forgiven. But when I become so dark and so hardened and so completely uh, opposed to Jesus that I call him evil, and it's, my, it's persistent, flagrant, and I take that to the grave, that's unforgivable. Once that door is shut, that is unforgivable. If I leave eternity having blasphemed against the Spirit, having spent my life completely demonizing Jesus and his church, and here's the thing that, that frightens me is that we have witch hunters who are looking at genuine moves of God in churches and saying that's the devil. When a revival at Asbury broke out last year, genuine repentance, genuine stuff of God was happening, and there were, there were a few out there saying, well, that just must be the devil. You better be real careful before you use that word, son. You better be very careful, because when you say heretic, you're essentially attributing something to the devil. So let me let me say this. The, and I, I'm going over time a little bit, but I think I need to spend a little more time. Here we go. It's not heresy. I'm going to tell you what's not heresy and then what is heresy. And this is a limited amount. There's probably more you could add to this. But there's, this is just a limited view, okay? I'm, I'm taking a little bit of time here. First of all, it's not heresy just because you disagree with it. You know, there are Christians who have doctrinal positions that you don't agree with. That doesn't mean they're a heretic. That might mean they, they and they might be wrong. Their doctrine, your doctrine might be perfect. I mean, you might be one of those people, you're so theologically correct, um, even, you don't even get, uh, you know, mosquito bites. I mean, you are just so on target spiritually. 
and somebody might disagree with some doctrine you have, that doesn't make them a heretic necessarily, depending on what they're disagreeing with. Okay? Number two, a heretic. Somebody's not a heretic just because they're doing something you don't understand. You know, if you see somebody speaking in tongues and you don't speak in tongues and you don't understand that, you don't know why they do that. That does not mean they're a heretic. It means you don't understand what they're doing. And they might be real or not. I'm, I'm not. I don't know about that particular person that you're looking at. But you might go into a church where nobody speaks in tongues, and you might think, "Well, I don't understand that. I don't understand those people. Like, why are they so quiet? Why are they so dead? They're not dead. Just because they don't do what you do doesn't mean they're dead." I get. I get sick of both camps. I get sick of the super quiet, no no outward show people. Go into a place where people that's very outward and stuff, and say, "All oh, those people are of the devil." I don't. You know. Or these spirit-filled people go to a church where they're not doing all that outward stuff and say, well, they're dead. They're just, they're just dead. Who are you to make that kind of a judgment just because they don't express the spirit the way you do? You see my point? So it's not heresy just because you don't get into it. Just because it's not your experience. Just because it's not in your tradition. And just because it's not your denomination or because they don't use your favorite words. There's another thing. If you don't use my favorite word, my, my, now they don't say favorite words, but if you don't talk about this, if you don't talk about this, you're a heretic. If you don't say this in your gospel presentation, you're a heretic. If you, you know, and it's like nitpicking. If you've got a nitpick to find a heretic, you haven't found one. Because let me tell you, you read the book of Jude. You read 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. First, second Peter. You read the letters of Paul. False teachers and heretics are blatant. They might be sneaky, but sooner or later they show up quick. And you get them near some real believers and the difference will be just as clear as day. Let me tell you a few things to look for with what is heresy. Heresy is when I diminish who Jesus is. Heresy is it's when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and you say, well, no, actually, he's just a moral teacher. That's heresy. When you diminish the word of God and you say, well, you know, the scripture is not really reliable. We'll just kind of go with our instincts and our feelings. That's heresy because Jesus said, uh, Jesus talked about the word all the way through his ministry and the prophets and the law. And the Bible is the word of the living God. Now, now, how you interpret the Bible, we can discuss that. But let me tell you something. It's the word of God. And when if you reject his word, that's heresy. When you reject things that are clear and across the board understood Christian doctrine. For example, salvation is by grace through faith, and not of yourself is the gift of God. When Paul in Galatians chapter 1 said, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than the one that we have, the, the apostolic gospel, the message the apostles preached, let him be accursed. Paul said, even an angel preaches to you a message like that, let him be accursed. And friends, we have people who are saying like this, well, the apostles didn't really understand what we understand today, which means they have rejected the teachings of the apostles. Jesus said to his apostles, while he was on this earth, he said, whoever listens to you listens to me. He equated what he was going to give them to teach the church with his own teachings. And so you might say, well, Jesus didn't talk about this or this or this. His apostles did. And whoever listens to his apostles listens to him. So you don't play that game. And so here's the thing. If, if a person goes against the clear foundational teachings of the gospel, in Colossians, Paul writes, don't let anybody deceive you or disqualify you by getting you into all kinds of legalism and the worship of angels and, and, and uh, following food laws and that kind of thing. In other words, legalism is heresy. Saying you have to earn your salvation by the things you do and by praying to angels and other people and things like that, then that's heresy. Gee, we have one mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our mediator. We don't need somebody else. And so when you have a cult that says, well, Jesus is okay, but we also have this system of rules and regulations, that that's treading and you might be treading into legalism here. Okay? And so those kinds of things, any teaching 
that undermines God's call to obedience and holiness is heresy. When you have a teaching, and how do I know that? Because in Revelation, Jesus at least twice mentions the Nicolaitans. And if you go back and study who the Nicolaitans were, there's a sketchy information, but the bottom line and what we understand about them was that they taught that since you're in Christ, you can live any way you want to. And there are people basically teaching that. You can live any way you want because you're in Christ. And he's forgiven all sin, so just go and Jesus did it. Come and get it and then sin, sin, sin. Sin all you want. Um, you know, that's heresy. Heresy, if it calls you away from obedience to Jesus Christ, as revealed in his word, it's heresy. If it adds to the word of God or takes away from the word of God, it's heresy. If it diminishes the purpose that, for which God calls us, uh, you, you could be, you might be treading into heresy. Now, now we've got to be careful using that word, friends. You have, you better make sure before you call something the devil. You better make sure it's not just that you don't understand it. There have been movements that I did not understand, and at first I thought they were wrong. But the more I got to know them and those people, I began to see the fruit of the Spirit, the impact of the cross and the gospel message. I began to say, oh, wait a minute. These people aren't heretics. They're just doing it in a way I'm not used to. And so, friend, be very careful. Because you, like Gamaliel said to the, his fellow Jewish leaders when they were in the book of Acts, trying to decide to do what to do with Peter and John, because they had just done a miracle and they couldn't deny it. And they said, what are we going to do to keep this thing from spreading? And Gamaliel said, guys, you'd better chill. Because if it's not of God, it'll fall apart. If it is of God, you'll find yourself fighting him, and you don't want to do that. Listen, if there is a movement out there that you're not sure you understand, unless there is a blatant and flagrant evidence of heresy, just let them do what they're doing. And, and ask God for wisdom and discernment. Now, we need to be people of discernment because there is false teaching out there. There is heresy out there. All I'm saying is don't be so quick to call it the devil because it may just be something you don't understand. Measure it by, here's a quick measure. The Bible says don't believe, don't despise prophecy, but test everything. Don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits. Let me give you a quick test. Number one, Jesus. He's the number one test. Does it conform to his teachings and to his character? Right? If it doesn't line up with who he is and what he taught, if a man tells you that God told him to leave his wife and marry somebody else, that doesn't line up with Jesus. I don't care how popular he is, how many miracles he's doing. That ain't Jesus. Number two, the fruit of the Spirit. You know, every move of God is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so we say, let me just go ahead and say both things. The fruit of the Spirit and the works of the Spirit, right? Casting demons out, healing the sick, raising the dead, setting people free, preaching the gospel, salvation coming. All the stuff of the kingdom is done by the Spirit, okay? The second thing, though, is it better be backed up with the fruit of the Spirit. Because the devil can do false things that look like it, right? He appears as an angel of light, but he can't bear the fruit of the Spirit. He just can't do it. So we've got the fruit of the Spirit and the work of the Spirit. It, it, is that evident in it, right? The next thing is it's a building up the body of Christ. You see, all the manifestations of the Spirit and all the teachings and all the work of the church ought to be equipping the saints and building up the body of Christ. Heresy pulls away from the body of Christ. If you've got a teacher in your life that's saying you don't need them church people, you, you just come follow me, then you might have heresy uh, at your door. And you might want to be, I'm not saying you will, but you might. It might be just a misguided person who needs to grow up and come back to church. But it might be heresy, and so you've got to be careful. So, and, and, and finally, does it agree with the Word of God? Now, I don't mean does it agree with every little proof text opinion of you guys. We all have opinions, right, that, that vary based on the word and our understanding of it. But the core beliefs, the running themes of Scripture, does it line up with those? And so ask God to give you guidance. But before you yell heretic, get on your face before God and first 
get the demon out of your own life. Because Jesus said, don't you dare get the splinter out of somebody else's eye when you're sitting there with a, with a Redwood National Forest in yours. Okay? So, search your own heart. Because the big thing with the Pharisees was they saw the devil in everybody except themselves. Search your own heart first. Then you can see clearly to take the speck out of somebody else's eye. Friend, let's go after Jesus. Let's go after the gospel of the kingdom. Let's, let's stay close to the word. Let's stay in the Holy Spirit. Let's stay in fellowship with one another. Let's pull together for the kingdom. And let's be careful who we bite and devour lest we consume each other. God bless you and go in peace.